that you have um, a very different view of the role of the Arab League. Um, I'm much more cynical about the role of the Arab League and the way in which Syria has become a proxy fight between some of the Gulf states and Iran, but that's a whole different discussion. But what I'm very interested in, and I want to go back to the issue of stalemate, is how, what can be done now? There was an LA Times article about you and your work in which you suggested that what's needed is 30,000 unarmed peacemakers. Can you spell that out? Because many of us are support the uprising, are interventionist, and don't know what to do. And it was a very intriguing I idea. spoke about 50,000 peace, peace, uh, pacifist peacemakers in September 2011. I don't think that this is realistic today, no. Today, I think that we need a number of thousands of peacekeepers of UN on the ground where the people are massacrating each other to protect the Sunni from the Shabiha and then the families of the Shabiha from the revenge of the Sunni and the Christian both sides <laughs> and in between. This is needed. And aside of that, we need the, the, the assistance and the solidarity of the international global society with 30 or 50 uh, uh, thousand people coming for all kind of humanitarian assistance. <laughs> we need people specialized in rehabilitation, people that have been suffering torture or people that have been giving torture to others. We need people to bring back our youth from all kinds of extremisms, because we have groups of fundamentalists on the ground, and we have to rehabilitate these, I would say kids, because I'm not man, but those youth. And, and, and uh, we, we need all kinds of assistance from the uh, UN through NGOs to help us to go out of the tragedy that already happened, even if we stop it today. And the democratic uh, <coughs> mutation need an assistance. Uh, I think, uh, for example, in UN, there is, uh, in USA, there is an organization called the, uh, Inter uh, the P Nonviolent Peace Forces. It's an interesting organization that could help a lot, <coughs> could help a lot. And, and it should come in. All kind of this organization, when you put together Red Cross and others, will make easily 50,000. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. The three, but you I should be. choose one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, for me as an American, why should I care about Syria, which is at the end of the world, whether to support the uprising or do anything for them? And if I choose as an, I'm an, an ignorant person and I choose not to do anything, what is going to be affecting me? How it's going to be affecting me? I, want in, I was in Victoria. That is the kind of St. James of Compostela of, the, of America, you know? The <coughs> Finisterre, the end of the world, west side. And I said in the university that uh, if you take the civilizational valley of the Mediterranean Sea as a river, the river flow until uh, the uh, west coast of this continent. You cannot separate this civilization from the Mediterranean civilization. And Syria, if you look at the Mediterranean river, just the source. A new source. Uh -huh. A big source. An important source. Uh, important so it, we are in from under this uh, concept somehow all series. We should take care of our civilizational source. Uh, and on another level, it is so clear that Syria is the fulcus, the fulcrum 
Focus or fulcrum. Fulcrum. The fulcrum has nothing to do with the room. It's a fulcrum of such essential and delicate geostrategical and symbolical issue in in West Asia that not to deal with this will uh, take apart the entire region and create an incredible cancer for international peace processes, let's say. So this is my little answer. Choose yourself somebody. Oh. Okay. My name is Bahnani Amin. I am the publishing manager of Al Arab newspaper. And also I'm the president of Christian Citizen for Democracy. Nice. Up to now, unfortunately, or our community, Christian community, they believe that the regime, if it go down, they will go down with him, which I did believe is not true. What you can say to those people, and I'm going to mention it in the Arab newspaper because I'm going to cover all this uh, lecture and what you tell those people because a lot of them they believe that in Oxair was uh, some cleaning uh, Christian cleaning uh, they believe also that in Aleppo and Damascus because they are supported by some ar bishops and archbishop like no these, are, they, they, these yeah. are people that have been drawn into a negationist attitude you have been here when I spoke about yes, the yes, yes. So th there is a sister in Cara, Sister Agnes, uh, that works with the extreme negationists, right-sided European, and even with the post-Stalin post radical ne negationists of because of their anti-imperialist attitude. So from the extreme right to the extreme uh, left has been invited in Rome, and perhaps she is speaking today, and <coughs> to a gathering of extreme anti-imperialist uh, uh, communists uh, that says, uh, um, they have learned the Arabic stuff. <laughs> Even Sister Agnes? <laughs> and she, uh, she is absolutely is absolutely is against nature, these alliances, but it's a fact on the ground. Uh, so, uh, all the work we have done for interreligious dialogue has been considered rubbish by these people. They said the only thing we want is a strong power able to implement by force a secularization of our society because we don't have any hope in Islam as such. We tolerate Muslims, but we cannot tolerate Islam. Tolerate Islam. So this is the big boom. <coughs> and I know that many Christians are not of this idea, but they have to come back, let's say. Huh? So me and you will go back soon to work with the so. rests of the Christians. Huh? I'm afraid that we will go in seeing them going coming out. I hope um, it's always a pleasure to see you, Father. Um, it's an interesting, there's an opening, job opening in Syria coming soon for a Mifti of Syria. Would you take that job? <laughs> 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 I hope you accept that job because I will definitely with you. It is a nice joke <laughs> and uh, it, is, it is a plenty of affection and consideration yeah, 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 joke. And, and so far. You're definitely qualified to be a Mifti of the Syrian, including a Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and whatever the, the sectors that are available this in is Syria. Your, your kindness am I honored to be appointed the servant of Syrian reconciliation. That's why I dress my reconciliation uh, t-shirt. Eh? Uh, and and uh, uh, to
today the word reconciliation is used in Syria in a negationist attitude. So uh, <coughs> this negotiation, this the reconciliation is not the one that's been preached in last weeks by people that say, okay, the revolution failed, the repression failed, let's go all together with Bashar al-Assad to have the right Syria we want. <laughs> Again, I don't agree on that reconciliation. Because there is not the fact of memory recognizing all the crimes of the regime in 40 years <laughs> and the crimes of the regime in this last one and a half year. Uh, and, and so far, I don't see any legitimacy for Mr. Bashar al-Assad. He has to go. But the Syrians should take care of each other. Uh, be afraid for each other, not from each other. You, start, you, you spoke about the hopes. I don't know when you wrote that book, but that's a wonderful book. I've never read it, but the title of it should give me a lot of hope by just seeing you and listening to you. Um, and, and the hope that for the last 50 years, entire Syrians are really looking for it and <coughs> be suppressed by the regimes by the fears of other sectors claiming that um, uh, what the behaviors of ancestors have done for them, so they would have a fear that would, this will repeat itself in the future, and it's, a, it's a becoming another myth that we've been developing among the youth. And we know that the, the revolution started from the youth, not from the older that had those fears. So the fears of uh, massacres or genocide that would ever take some place uh, uh, in the future I think it's just a myth that will never exist. I'm sorry, again. do you have a question? So I'm just elaborating on Oh, that. yeah, but because um, there's people. Um, so I just, like, but yeah. I just want to make yeah. sure that's clear because I never read, read that book. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. I understand the desire to elaborate, and I welcome your position. And I'm afraid, uh, to be sincere, uh, that if the Muslim community is not able to work critically on itself, we will see more blood. So the, I believe in the democratic evolution of the Muslim community. And I don't believe in a secular society to protect us from the Muslim religion. I believe in the energy of religions to bring values to a democratic <laughs> pluralistic society. That's why in Cairo, I reacted to the repetition of the slogan, Deen Lillah wal Watan al the, 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 the religion is for God, and the, and the country should be for all. Because this is a pessimist definition of the relationship between religion and society. I believe in, in something else. This is not the slogan yet, but perhaps. Uh, 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 we, we, we believe in the help of religion in building a democratic country. Okay, we, we heard a lot about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. They are in control of the revolution as well as the SNC. Do you think if the... The SS what? The SNC, the yeah. Syrian National oh, yeah. Council, yeah. controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood, do you think Syria will become a Muslim state as like Iran? If the revolution w uh, win, I don't think that the it does not look like that the uh, the Muslim brothers are planning to have a kind of wilayat al faqih like the one of Iran. The uh, it seems like that the idea of Dawla madaniya, the the civil state, not necessarily secular but civil, mm -hmm. it's, it's been uh, elaborated sincerely in the context of the Muslim Brotherhood. Also because of the experience of democratic countries that the brothers spread all over the world in Europe and North America had, and so far that they had a kind of revision of the dream, of the myth, the foundational myth, and now they have received the idea that the democratic uh, society is the best solution even for an Islamic uh, a project, and they always accepted the idea that an Islamic society is plural, 
it is more difficult to see how uh, Muslim brothers can deal with uh, the Mo Muslim Shiite movement. It, it should be uh, possible to find a deal, uh, for example, with the experience of Hamas, that is, uh, Hamas is Sunni, Muslim brother, aspired movement, and was for years the allied of uh, the Hezbollah and Iran and Syria regime. So it should be possible to elaborate. We have to work all together. There are big risks. Uh, they prefer big risks, this st stinking regime. Professor Gilbert, can you expand on that, um, on his question a little bit more about the possibility of um, a Sunni-dominated um, or Sunni-inspired state, uh, like, like the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah, there's two aspects of it. Number one, uh, the, <laughs> the Muslim Brotherhood actually endorsed the regime, if you remember, uh, uh, several years ago, saying that <laughs> since the regime is uh, pro-Palestinian, uh, that uh, they would not stab their Palestinian brothers in the back by uh, taking action against the regime as well. But I, I think, you know, what Father Paolo said is, is, is very important. Islamic movements do not exist outside of politics. Islamic movements exist within a realm of politics that defines what is the realm of the possible, what are the goals, what are the mobilizational strategies, how do you play the game, okay? And we see this time and time again. Now, our problem is this. Our problem is, is that we, we are frozen, not the Muslim mo movements. We are the ones who are frozen. We're frozen in the 1980s and 1990s, and our attitude towards most Muslim movements happens to be, well, look, I mean, look what happened in the 1980s, look what happened in the 1990s. We had these violent cadre organizations, you know, throughout the Islamic world and the Arab world as well, that, you know, attempted to overthrow various regimes with violence, that attempted to impose Islamic values, Sharia law, and so on and so forth. That's frozen in time, that's our view. What's happened subsequently to that, though, has been a whole variety of things, including this international diffusion of notions of uh, democratic and human rights. And the Muslim movements in, throughout the world have not been immune from that. As a matter of fact, they participate in that quite well. So you see, actually, starting in 1988 or so with the uh, October, Black October riots in Algeria, where you had Islamist movements participating for democratic rights, uh, Kafaya in Egypt, Demo uh, uh, Muslim movements participating in a movement for uh, democratic rights. The Bahraini Intifada in the 1990s, Islamic movements, both Sunni and Shi'i in, in the case of Bahrain, also um, uh, fighting for democratic and human rights. And yet we stand outside and we say, this has got to be a sham. You know, they can't really believe this. Why can't they believe this? Why is it impossible to say that, you know, uh, you know this has been a shift that has taken place? I'm old enough to remember when there was political science literature on whether or not Catholicism was compatible with democracy. I was saying exactly the no. same. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing you, it came to my mind. I said, look, I'm a Catholic, but altogether I try to be a democratic. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the examples were Spain and Portugal and all the Latin American dictatorships. And you know, all of a sudden you extrapolate from that and you say, what do these guys have in common? They're Catholic. So therefore, Catholics can't be democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Very good example. If they quit Catholicism, they win. <laughs> Not mine. I have two questions, one for the professor and one for Abuna. Uh, professor, we have the scenario in our neighbor, Lebanon, after a bloody civil war, uh, what they, some people call sectarian democracy established, where the president had to be from a certain sect, or foreign leader and stuff like that. Is there a possibility that that might happen in Syria after uh, al Assad's war? No. I have a question for Abuna. Abuna would say no. I don't think it's possible in Syria. I think that basically what you're going to have is either you're going to have a non-confessional state or basically what you're going to have is you know, fundamentally a bloodbath. You're not going to have the sort of intervention that took place. First of all, colonial intervention. Starting all the way back to 1860, you know, in which the, you know, uh, uh, the colonial powers at that time, Britain and France, basically said to the Ottoman Empire, look, you have to resolve this thing in the following way. And then they created a special administrative uh, district in Mount Lebanon, and that's the basis upon which we get to confessionalism in Lebanon today. Okay? 
that was worked out again. It was uh, uh, worked out uh, uh, under the Ottomans, and then in, in 1943, the deal that was made, and then Taif Agreement, and, and you know, uh, also that just rearranged the deal a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. This has always been worked out in terms of the sectarian politics of Lebanon. This is not the way Syria has ever been worked out, and that's what the problem. That one of the problems that Syrians are going to face, actually, you know, in that sense. The problem is, is that you know when the West comes in, it creates these sectarian divisions in part to protect minority Christian communities. You know we see this, you know, not only uh, in, in in Lebanon, we see this in various other places in the Middle East. And what model did we use in Iraq in, in 2003 when we went in there? Well, what we have to do is we have to ensure minority representation. We look at it in terms of what are these people anyway? They are what their religion is. Okay? So we have Sunnis, we have Shi'is. We don't have Iraqis that we're dealing with. We have Sunnis and Shi'is. We all know that Sunnis are going to vote Sunni, Shi'is are going to vote Shi. The same, the same thing that happened in Lebanon as well. So I doubt such a thing would take place in Syria. Uh, let me elaborate one phrase on this same issue. I will put it in completely e the opposite way. I'm not happy. I'm, I'm really very painful, pain, but I'm I have some hope in the fact that the Alawite mountain and the Kurdish <coughs> area will resist to a democracy of a presidential democracy built on a majority. I believe in a democracy of consensus that is not to stick on a confessional identity, but to have a dialectic that obliges you in constitutional essential elements to go with 70% of a majority. It means to have the consensus of the society convinced that the our identity is on plural and civil and friendly a society. So we have now the Alawites, they have plenty of weapons. They will not give up, even if Bashar goes, they will not give up, they have Russia and Iran with them. So we are obliged to invent a neutral Syria, like Austria after the Second World War. We should not side with Russia or with America, not side with Iran or Saudi Arabia. Let be a pole of reconciliation in the region. Last question for you. No, no. I don't know. No need. No, no, the other no, one. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. There is so plenty of people it. having other questions. Oh, no, he had a question for you, Mr. Yeah, but I yeah, answered for the first one. <laughs> it's a very start at the end. <laughs> Not too much democracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you had your hand up uh, for a while. Yeah. Um, Father, thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to ask you about what do you think are the obvious and maybe not so obvious roadblocks to your vision, which I absolutely agree with your vision of Syria and how it should be in the future, but what do you think are the biggest obstacles that we're going to see ahead of us, other than the obvious that are happening now? All the kind of fundamentalisms, of negationisms, of m mythologies, the, the nationalist or Islamist or uh, uh, the ideas of Christian superiorities, all this make disasters. Huh? So, so we, we, we need to to ask God to give us an open mind and a welcoming soul and a hospitable attitude I'm wondering to one each other. I mean, this, I, know, I don't see any way out, out of <laughs> these values that are our values, very Arabic values.